Daily Detroit is brought to you by the community. Support our work at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. Hey, it's Jer. Hello and welcome to your Daily Detroit. It's Wednesday, September 16th, 2020. Today. Kristen Ussery from Detroit Vegan Soul and Victoria Katansky of Hatch Detroit join me to talk about the reopening of the restaurant's east side location and what the nonprofit Hatch Detroit is up to, considering there's not a contest this year. Then, Fletcher Sharp gives us the inside line on roster changes ahead of the fall tournament for Detroit City FC, and we talk about Big Ten football making the decision to play. But first, there will be more bumps in the road ahead for the city of Detroit but these bumps will be welcomed by many residents. At a press event Wednesday, Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan announced that a pilot program to install more speed bumps, sometimes called speed cushions, is expanding. He said the city plans to install up to 4,500 of these bumps on streets across the city of Detroit and at a cost of $11.5 million, and they're to be paid for from state transportation and other funding sources. In the spring, installation begins on a number of streets that have a 25-mile-per-hour speed limit. Priority will be given based on three criteria. First, the amount of traffic on the street. Second, if there are police reports of excessive speeding. And third, if the street is a bypass or often used to cut over to a major road. Well, as someone who lives near some of these, many of my neighbors are pretty happy about the program. Calming traffic can help increase the quality of life in neighborhoods, as well as lower the risk of accidents, especially with kids and pets. That also tends to make it a bit more bike-friendly. With the program, there's the goal of working with smaller Detroit-based and minority-owned asphalt companies. They're asking company owners who are interested to call 313-224-3901 to learn more about the work and to bid next year. Joining me virtually is Vittoria Katansky. She is the executive director of Hatch Detroit and Kirsten Ussery, co-owner of Detroit Vegan Soul. Welcome to you both to Daily Detroit. Hi, thank you for having us. So first, let's get started with the tasty news. Detroit Vegan Soul is swinging back open your doors. Kirsten, what drove the decision to make that happen now? Well, it was always our intention to reopen you know, but we wanted to make sure that we were doing it safely and that we had a staff that was prepared and ready to go. And so it took us a little time to be able to do that. For sure. And is this West Village or both locations? This is West Village. So our location on Grand River uh, remained open throughout all of this time. We had to close the location in West Village on Agnes in March. Mm. And so now we're we're reopening that location for curbside service only. And what was behind the decision for doing curbside? Because I know there's some restaurants trying to stretch out the social distancing and things like that. And then others that have just decided, okay, we're just going to stick to curbside. We're going to stick to converting to like a delivery model temporarily. Right. Well, for us, you know, we, we looked at several factors. One is that our locations are already very small. So we only had about 30 seats in each location to properly social distance. You know, we'd be reducing those seats significantly. And also just the safety factor. Because of what's going on, we did have staff who weren't comfortable coming back to work It took us a little while to be able to hire some new staff and get them trained and uh, make sure that they were in line with all of our safety guidelines and, you know, all of that. And so because we're working with smaller staffs, we didn't feel comfortable going to a full dine in model yet. It's much easier to to manage the curbside, you know, with a smaller staff and make sure that our staff and guests are going to be able to be safe. Well, I know listeners and fans of uh, your work are going to want to know. So what is the menu going to look like? Is it edited? Is it the same as it always was? So for the East location, it is edited. We want to make sure that we are safe, that we are able to provide a quick and efficient service for people. And so... The menu is a little bit reduced. It will be mostly sandwiches, soups, salads. We'll we'll have our soul platter, our traditional soul platter, and probably a different main course each day. So that that's a little different from 
our um, usual menu, which consists of more main courses. So basically, we're, we're going to more of a menu that's sandwich heavy than main course heavy. That's really the big difference there. Well, then in that case, what are a couple of things that people should really uh, give a try to when they see this? Well, we have our uh, bacon ranch tofu wrap. That's a, a huge hit. And, you know, basically the items that we're offering are our most popular items. So our DVS burger, the wrap that I mentioned, uh, our catfish tofu sandwich, barbecue tofu sandwich. And there will be some specials like uh, people can expect to see a reappearance of our Philly cheese steak. That was a, a very popular dish, especially at the East location. And so, you know, we'll have some surprises along the way like that. So when it comes to the East location, uh, what days and your hours? So for this week, we're actually going to get things going again tomorrow. And we'll be open tomorrow, Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Then beginning next week, we'll be open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So that's the week of Tuesday, September 22nd is when we'll be at the 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. hours, Tuesday through Saturday. And because we're opening a little earlier, another surprise that we'll have for people over the next couple of weeks is uh, some brunch items that we're going to introduce into the menu for that location. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, I'm just I'm just a big fan of that corner of the city. You know, my grandmother lived over on Seminole, so I've always been around there for a while. So I'm I'm excited to see that this is happening. And I really appreciate like learning about all this. Victoria, I'll, I'll pivot to you. What has changed in these COVID times with what you're doing? Because it just things are just very, very different. You know, the restaurant landscape, when you're talking about even supporting like retail and, and brick and mortar businesses, which if people don't remember over the years, you all have had numerous contests to award money for, you know, startup businesses and things like that in the city that are doing brick and mortar. How do things change for you? Yeah, in some ways, it's totally different. And in others, it hasn't changed much. Basically, we just we're not doing the contest this year, which has been a pretty big change. We're not necessarily as out there in the public, but we've been working pretty hard with our alumni businesses to just try to help them come up with creative ideas to change how they do their work to, you know, trying to help them get some publicity about what they're actually doing. And then a lot of just guidance and really where I've spent most of my time is trying to help businesses redo their business plans so that they can talk about how their funding model works in COVID at times. So working with businesses that, you know, they have loans that are based on numbers that no longer exist. So what we're trying to do is be proactive and get them in front of their lenders with numbers that actually show where we are in this world and try to see what we can do for their payback schedules and things as a result of that. Well, for the people listening, do you have any tips or things that you've learned working with these businesses over the last few months uh, that maybe you could share with others? I think for both businesses and consumers, I think, you know, you got to be patient right now. Erica or in Kirsten are opening up their spot and they're testing out hours. They're testing out new processes that they haven't used before. And they're taking it slow so that they can accommodate, you know, the consumer the best way that they can and maintain the quality that they've always had. I think for consumers, they have to understand that and that they may not get exactly what they want all the time right now, but understand that, you know, <laughs> these are these are very trying times for business owners as well. And they're trying to come up with ways, you know, to help them. So don't go to Yelp immediately. It's a hard time for everybody. I think for businesses, the biggest piece is really feeling confident to test out different ideas and to be a little bit more, you know, get out of your head, right? Uh, you've done, a lot of our businesses have done things the same way for six years or five years. And sometimes it's hard for them to think of a new normal. So some of the work we've done is try to get them to think of a new normal, get out of their head and think of ideas that 
maybe will work better in today's world. What is your sense around today's world? Like I've been listening to various podcasts. We've been ta- having various guests. What's your sense around the new normal? Is this a, a shorter time horizon? Is this longer? Can you not even speculate at this point? I don't think anybody can really speculate. It changes daily. The thing I've noticed though, I mean, recently it's, it's not changing as frequently. At the beginning of this, it changed every day or so. You know, you didn't know if you had to clean everything 50 million times before you could even eat off of it. And now it's just a little bit wearing a mask, being socially distanced, like the basics, they're livable. And I think what that means is we'll see more people feeling more comfortable going out to do things that they didn't go do before. For example, even going into a store, you know, in March, I wouldn't have gone into a store. Now, with the right equipment, I'm totally comfortable. Right. And, and I think that is something to think about. One of the threads that has repeated over and over on our show has been to let go of the idea of like magical thinking, because I think a lot of people have this idea that it's just going to go away in a short time or, you know, it'll be a couple of weeks or something. And it's more of like a hunker down and this is how things are until we, we know something different. Right. I, I really do think that there's no world where people are never going to go back to doing social things. I mean, we all want that and possibly even more now, maybe more than we realized we needed. Keeping that in mind, it, you know, there's all this speculation about just everybody working from their home offices and things like that for the end of time. And I can tell you that that's not happening in our house. <laughs> we will not be able to manage. <laughs> well, uh, before I let both of you go, I want to make sure that people know how to find you and how they can support each of you. So, Kirsten, can you uh, share where to do that online and uh, what people can do? Yes, absolutely. So people can go to our website at DetroitVeganSoul.com. And from the website, you can view our menus, you can order and pay online for your food, and you can select curbside service uh, to be able to pick up. You'll see our hours of operation for both locations. Again, that's um, DetroitVeganSoul.com. We're also on Instagram and Twitter as DETVeganSoul.com. And of course, you can find us on Facebook as Detroit Vegan Soul. And Victoria, the Hatch and the Hatch program, how can people help out? HatchDetroit.com. We do have an opportunity to allow people to donate to our organization. We're a nonprofit. And quite frankly, it's you know operating a nonprofit during this time when funding was reliant upon the contest and bringing in sponsorship dollars has been a little bit difficult. So, you know, we, we still have to maintain the work that we're doing and it's possibly even more important than it ever has been given the environment and the need from our alumni. Well, uh, Vittoria Katansky, Kirsten Ussery, thank you so much for your time today and uh, appreciate you both. Thank you. Talk to you soon. There's a lot happening in the local sports world, so we moved up our appointment with Fletcher Sharp to say hello to him. First off, we got to talk about the Big Ten. They are going to play. That was announced today, Wednesday. The word is it's going to be an eight-game season, four home, four away, starting October 24th. That's so that they can be eligible for the college football playoff. The way they're going to make this happen is through daily rapid COVID-19 testing. The idea is that they're going to test athletes and coaches starting at the end of this month. Uh, Their plan going forward is that if an athlete tests positive, they're going to not be able to play for 21 days following the positive diagnosis. They're also going to do this whole crazy plan with uh, enhanced prevention with this idea of team positivity rates. Uh, It's going to be on a sliding scale. Uh, When a team positivity rate goes over 5% and the population positivity rate goes over 7.5%, a Big Ten team will stop practicing and competition for a minimum of seven days. If you were thinking about going to these games, you won't be able to. Tickets will not be sold and fans will not be allowed to attend games this season. There might be some exceptions for families and uh, relatives of players, but that's on a school by school basis. And uh, we also know that the Big Ten championship game is scheduled for December 19th. Fletcher, you've been looking at this news. I ran it down really quick for listeners in case they didn't know. What are your thoughts? Dumb. This Ah. is very dumb. 
All right. And I'll tell you why. These are all college kids. And yes, they're the utmost maturest people at the college campus, as coaches would say, because coaches speak highly of their kids 95% of the time. But they're also still kids. All it takes is for one of these athletes to go over a friend's house who lives by the campus, even though there's there's no one on campus, get sick, come back to their teammates, test negative initially because the results don't always show up, and then infect everyone else. And then you have a team that's mostly sick. And then that team that's mostly sick is going to go play against someone else who's mostly sick. Kind of like the Major League Baseball where, where teams were fine. Then all of a sudden, two weeks in, like their team is just ravaged with COVID, whether it's coaches, whether it's players, whether it's people in the front – it's just, this is such a, I understand these kids really want to play. I know at first they were like, oh, we need to not play. We need to make sure our, our bodies are taken care of. We're kids. We're not chattel. We're actually, you know, human beings. But then when they realized that it was going for more than just a week or two and like an actual like thing, they're like, you know what, let's just let us play after all. Like, it's fine to let us play. If they want to play, it's fine. Like, I prefer they don't. I wish they wouldn't. But like, if they really want to do it, that's totally okay. But I. I don't think it's smart. I feel like it's money over lives at this point. And I hate for it to sound like that because I know these people don't have that much malice in their heart. It doesn't really seem to make sense to me. It just seems not great for the long run. Great for the short run. Great because you want to see some football, but like not great from the standpoint of, you know, is this actually safe? For me, as somebody who we've been covering this on the show, Ingham County, the home of Michigan State University, is considered you know, a high spread area right now. And we've got hundreds of cases that are going around and that's even when the college is closed. So, I mean, it just seems like this is something where there was a lot of push to get these players out there. The players, you know, obviously they wanted to do it. There's been a lot of tweets from players around this to, you know, get back out in the field, that sort of thing. But Fletch, how much of this is like psychology? Because a lot of these players, football is all they know. Yeah, it's I was I'm watching a documentary or I watched a documentary. I'm sure if you have Amazon Prime, you've probably seen it, too. The All or Nothing documentary this season, last season they followed Manchester City and the Brazilian national team for soccer. This year they followed Tottenham Hotspurs. And it got to the point of the documentary they were t- where they like document each part of the season, boom, 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 like this important game, whatever. They got to the part to where COVID happened and like everyone was just totally like reliving that moment of life was just crazy that March when you just realized what COVID was and what it meant. And like the players were like, okay, so we're going to be gone for a week or whatever. What happens during that week? And the, the doctor's like, no, no, like. You're going to be gone for much longer than a week. It's going to be like a few months, maybe. And the players just couldn't comprehend. And they had the sports psychologist come on. And he was like, these players are really, really great in their condition to be these top tier athletes, these top tier footballers. But to do that, sometimes they isolate themselves from what's happening in the actual world. So for them to find out that they couldn't actually do the thing that they've been graced to do, to do it kind of broke some of them. Some of them could not. They were like, okay, but after a week, then what? Well, then after two weeks, then what? And it's like, no, it's like after like, a few months, we still might not be back. So like you should get stuff in order. And with these college kids, that's why I'm trying to empathize with them because I was a college athlete. I understand, yes, if you're at school to do this one thing, if you have a scholarship for that one thing, you're probably there because that scholarship is paying for that. So I understand entirely. And I don't mean to like discredit that at all because I used to be a college athlete. I get it. I understand if you're at this big time school, part of the time you're there with that scholarship for that sport. That's the reason why you're there. Like, you might not be able to go to that big school otherwise. So I understand why some people are super hard-pressed to want to play. Because they know if I can't do this and honor this scholarship here, the school might not honor my commitment to this place. It might get rid of me. So I understand entirely why a lot of people are stressed about that. I'm not speaking for everybody because I know not everyone has the same circumstance. I don't want to sound like one of those, like, predatory, like, really racist people who's like, ah, they're here to escape the ghettos. But, like, some of these people really came from really hard, hard, hard lives really terrible places. And the way they got out was playing basketball, playing football, playing volleyball, tennis, golf, et cetera, soccer. So like for them to not be able to do that, they might backslide. And I understand the fear of that and the worry of that. I get that entirely, but also it's not worth potentially infecting yourself and people you care about because this disease, while we're, while we're certain that like it will end eventually. Sure. We don't know when that eventually is like eventually could be, in a month and eventually it could be in, you know, two years. So we should not be going out there and like making ourselves more susceptible to get it just because we really want to do something. And like, it's, it's hard. And honestly, that's the reason why America is still struggling with it because other countries are like, Hey, 
this stinks. We have to like, you know, limit ourselves to stuff. But if we just do this for like a few months and limit ourselves entirely and just bite the bullet and suck for a while, you know what? We'll be better. And we're as a country, we're like, nope, free speech. I'm doing whatever I want to. As a result, I'm not going to wear a mask. As a result, I'm going to go cough on people who say I should wear a mask. As a result, I'm going to keep doing what I want to do because I don't care about someone else because it doesn't affect me at all. And that's why we're still stuck in this thing. That's why us, Brazil, uh, and Russia are having problems because we're all like similar in the same mindset. And it's very like scary to see that like we're going to keep forcing kids out here to go do this. And yeah, I'll, I'll get talked down to you about it. I understand. But we're still forcing kids to do this. We don't even have like a, a cure or even like a, a prospective cure. Like we don't have anything where it's like we might be able to fix this. We have we're clueless there. But let's just keep doing stuff and hoping that it works like the rest of the world. We've already lost college athletes to COVID. We've lost a few college football players to COVID. And yes, I understand they got COVID not a part of the program. They got COVID separately. Uh, COVID affects people differently. And while I understand these offensive linemen and defensive linemen and linebackers are all like in great shape, although they're goliaths of human beings, being that big and having disease like this is not good. Not good at all. Like everyone who's like died from it in football has been like an offensive lineman, a big person. So I understand like yes, BMI does not matter for them because like it's a very skewed thing for athletes because it doesn't, does not measure muscle. I understand that being 400 pounds, whether you're in good shape or not, and ripped or you know not ripped, uh, having this disease is going to affect you horribly, and you should not be having people out there doing something while, while this is a potential thing to go around. That's my opinion on that. Uh, and just no, I no dumb dumb well as always this is where we are and it is what it is i guess right i, I i'm kind of uh gobsmacked by it but i also i'm also not surprised frankly to be very honest to pivot a little bit because there is some news with detroit city fc there's some roster changes ahead of the tournament that's coming up uh what's going on man because there was a lot of hype on social media last night coming into the season i did not think the even year curse would apply to detroit because I thought the dynamic midfield that they were going to be able to count on, which has really been their strength for most of the years. They've had a great midfield, a decent defense. Their attack has been eh. But then they lost Cyrus Sadie because he had, you know, he was not unable to play. He wanted to make sure he could stay safe. Becky Goodman also decided not to play, understandably so. Uh, Max Todd, former forward, Scottish international, went home to Scotland for COVID, could not get back. Sure, there's some visa issues. Would make some sense as to why. All three of those players are back. Cyrus Fitty and Becky Goodman definitely are great because they allow the midfield to be flexible and creative, whereas as of late, they've been very like flexible but not creative. In soccer, especially in lower division soccer, teams with the best midfields typically are really good because they're able to dominate control of the ball, and Detroit's really not been able to do that, save for the game they won against New Amsterdam. I'll say that. That's different, but that's more like a scrimmage than a real game. Every other game they've played in, they've not been able to hold possession of the ball. They've been like, all right, we have the ball for a few seconds. We'll make it pass. We lose it, whatever. They have no one who can break someone down and make the other team defense worried about someone going by them. With Cyrus, they have that. With Bakey, they have someone who can... Maybe not break someone down the way Cyrus does, but gets in there offensively and finds little gaps to then help the offense and also is not afraid to track back and help the defense. With Max Todd, they have a proven goal scorer who's shown to be fearless, sometimes a bit reckless, but fearless and sticking his nose in to get the ball in there. But having his three proven players, it won't guarantee they win the championship. I'm not going to go out there and say that. But I will say it drastically improves their chances of winning because they have a much more solid and rounded out squad than they did before. And this is not an indictment of any of the players that are already there that are playing for Detroit because they've done a decent job. But, like, if you can add three players, two of them, I guess you could say, club legends. One, definitely a club legend. And Cyrus, definitely doesn't hurt at all. So you're you're definitely more upbeat about the tournament now. I think they have a much better chance to win. I don't think they will win, potentially, but I think they have a much better chance. If they were to win with these three people being added, it would not surprise me. If they were to win without those three being added, I would be very much surprised. Well, it's great to see good news for Detroit City FC. Fletcher Sharp, thanks so much for sharing your thoughts with us today on everything that's happening. You can follow him at Saint FDW on Twitter. Talk to you soon, man. Yep, thanks for having me. And with that, we are done for today. One quick thing to remind you that if you have feedback for the show, want to yell at us, give us a story idea, any of that stuff, we have a voicemail and dial podcast line. You can call it at 313-789-3211. 
That's 789-3211 in the 313 area code. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Jer Stays. Take care of each other, and we'll see you around Detroit.